Hello, I'm Rhys Bowen. I write The Molly Murphy Mysteries, a historical mystery series set in early 1900s New York City, and the lighter, funnier Royal Spinus series, featuring a minor royal in the 1930s. I also write several big standalones, the latest of which is the Venice Sketchbook. And I love listening to the Dark and Stormy Book Club podcast. Hello, and welcome to episode 214 of Dark and Stormy Book Club. Today we talk to the wonderful Maureen Jennings. Enjoy! I'm Ann Dart. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club. A podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome! If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkandstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. We are very pleased to welcome to the program Maureen Jennings. She is the creator of the Murdoch Mystery Series that is very popular on television, as well as she's the author of three or four other series. Welcome, Maureen. Thank you very much. We want to start by saying that we were so pleased to meet you at Malice Domestic. We promise we will not shine a bright light in your face. <laughs> okay. okay. That must have been very uncomfortable for you that evening. Oh, it was a little bit. Yeah. I'm not an actor. I don't know how they do it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you have written 12 Murdoch Mysteries. Seven novels and a novella, then a bit of a jump to a different time period, but still a, a Murdoch story. So I, I guess I should say eight, shouldn't I? But you also have a series set in World War II, the <laughs> Tom Tyler. Right. Then you have Charlotte Crane. Yeah. She's in the 1930s. And yes. then you have Christine Morris, which is a modern series. I realized today, when I wrote it, it was modern. And now it's history. So. <laughs> oh, isn't that oh, funny? 2002, 2004. Oh, my gosh. Things have changed so much. Yes. Yes. Think of it, yes. Think of it as history. And then you have Murdoch set in the 1890s. Correct. How do you research all those different timelines? They're a bit more sequential than you just said. So that I kind of have moved, except for the Christine Morris one, which, as I said, I jumped. But everything else has been moving chronologically from the Victorians right up to 1936. I see it like that, although, strictly speaking, 2002 is in there. I see it very much as a chronology. No, that's not true either. I jumped around. Right. <laughs> it feels like that. It feels like as soon as I left behind the Victorian, then I was in another, well, to which I was, I was in another time period. So it's not that hard to keep them straight because they feel very different to me in terms of what I'm looking at, what I'm trying to write about. Yeah, they do. They feel very different. You don't try to write them at the same time, do you? <laughs> I don't know how people do that. I've heard of some people who do it. I couldn't. It has to be that, then that, then that. Yeah, for sure. Maureen, looking back before you were a writer and all your years of being a psychotherapist, did that help prepare you for being an author? I hope so. I think so. I've always enjoyed reading books that feel real. Certainly when I was growing up, honestly, I'd read a book and I felt like they were my friend. They seemed so real to me. So I think working with people for such a long time 
and trying to get a sense of everybody's dimensions and idiosyncrasies and histories. I hope that translated into characters that you can believe in. That's what I'm hoping anyway. I think that's what happens. That's part of what I love about the Murdoch series. The mystery, yes, it's wonderful, but it's how much you get into these characters' lives and you've built this world that we just absolutely love and care about. Oh, great. Thank you. That's what I hope. Yeah. Come in. I say, come in. <laughs> <laughs> My question on your years as a psychotherapist also. How would you diagnose Murdoch as he is portrayed on television? Well, frankly, I'm a tiny bit unhappy about that, although I do understand we've been going so long, which is wonderful. I didn't actually write him as such a nerd, <laughs> <laughs> which he is. He is. I wrote him as what I thought was a fairly typical repressed detective with lots going on inside. In the first movies of the week, we had a different actor, Peter Outerbridge. And I was so happy with the way he just conveyed all of this stuff was going on inside him all the time. And then we switched. We did well with the movies of the week. So then we moved to a series. And as the series went on, I don't know what exactly what happened because Murdoch started to become, as I said, a nerd. And I'm going, wait a minute. <laughs> Let's just have him sort of intense and repressed and... But the thing that has evolved, which didn't come from me, which I'm glad about, is the whole thing that he invents a lot of things. We always yes. say you know, Murdoch's invented absolutely everything. And I didn't get into that, mostly because I just didn't know. You know, that's not quite where my strengths are. But I, I'm happy about that. In answer to your question, really, most of us people, we've got depths, you know, a little sometimes dark depth, sometimes not. And I wanted to convey that. And I think that came out, I hope that came out in the books. And I certainly think it came out originally, where there's a feeling that this man, there's a lot to this guy. He's deep. He's got lots of depth. So. <laughs> now, did you base your characters on real people or are they completely made up? I don't know if any writer ever completely makes everything up, honestly. You get a little bit here and a little bit there, and they become sort of a pastiche of people that you know. It's true, you know. I say, oh, I think I'll take that little bit or that quirk, and then you put them into one character that, again, hopefully is believable, because you probably know this, but some years ago, our big Canadian star, Margaret Atwood, some people complained. They were actually going to go legal, apparently, because they said it was two people. They said that she had put them in a book, which wasn't true, which was a fiction book. I knew it wasn't true, but they said, oh, no, that really is like me. Well, yeah. Oh, I mean, my goodness. Isn't that hilarious? They, they dropped it. There was no leg to stand on. When you're creating a fictional character, yes, you might be. For example, in my very first book, there was a man, I actually hadn't met him, but I knew of him. And I knew he was a real creep, frankly. <laughs> he was not a nice guy. And so I created the character in the book. So I started out, I'm going to make my character like this guy. And then as soon as I started writing, the character said, well, not exactly, you know, I've got a little bit more vulnerability and this and that, and that, and that sort of happens when you're writing. And again, you hear writers say this all the time about the characters starting to take over, which in a certain way, it's a nice thing. They start telling you, obviously it's all me, but they start saying, yeah, well, remember I, I had that terrible experience <laughs> and you go, all right, <laughs> that's why you're a creep. All right. <laughs> oh, I love it. Escapes me of who said this, but we were interviewing somebody from Canada and they had said that a lot of Canadian writers, even though they're Canadian, they make their characters from the United States because they sell better if they're from the United States. Is that true? Yes, many, many times. 
it's less true. I think it was true 30 years ago, maybe, maybe less. And it's very much a commercial thing. It's a big issue. It's been talked about many times. It's a weird sort of Canadian inferiority complex, frankly. For example, my books are set in Toronto, except for the English books. This was a bit of a no-no. Who would be interested in Toronto? I didn't agree with it then, and I don't now. It had truth to it. It definitely did. If you're looking at a big market, then you might say, well, they don't want to see it in Toronto. They want to see it in Chicago or New York or Baltimore. And I think there's truth to that, of course. You can't shape your story to that. It's like trying to say, well, I want to write a bestseller. So what's selling right now? Oh, can't do that ever. Yeah. Doesn't work. You really make Canada... Even though it's the backdrop, it's just, it's, it, part it, it's of like an ode to, to Canada. And I've been there many times and you make me want to come back. <laughs> oh, thanks, Tracy. No, that was important to me. And again, trying to go with what I liked and like still, I like a place settings where, where are their interests, where they're almost as much of a character as the characters. I like reading books like that. And I quite consciously wanted to make Toronto as vivid and non-anonymous as I could. Because I live here, I can walk around, I can see. So, you know, probably the same with you guys is that it's going. The past is being literally demolished, mm -hmm. which is disappointing. There's still enough that I can walk down College Street or wherever Murdoch's is and i can still get a feeling for the 1890s early night you know how it is and yes. I, I like that is the series shot in toronto yes or no it's so expensive practically to shoot on location but because the show has done well we have a fantastic back lot and if you do come up tracy i'll absolutely take you over there it's oh yay <laughs> It's fabulous. It's got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And that stands in, you'll see that a lot, but you know, that's supposed to be where the station is. But other than that, we shoot in a lot of small towns, again, because of the historical look, they are not being demolished for glass cubes the way we are here. Mm -hmm. So you can get a feeling because it's supposed to be that it's supposed to be the early 1900s you can still see it one of the location scouts said to me once which i never thought about he said the problem is with the windows that we all want to change our windows and open them up which of course back then wasn't the case so to find a small town where people haven't changed their windows but definitely having this fabulous back lot has made a huge difference oh good now when you are reading just for yourself and you come across an event that happened in Canadian history. Is that where you get your ideas for the installments that you write? Yes, absolutely. I have found that the old newspapers, I read them a lot. I can get them online. I use those a lot. And sometimes it's just a little snippet. For example, if I'm using this in my book I'm writing right now, because it just jumped out at me. Okay, 1936, there was just a little tiny snippet, and it said these two young boys, and I think they were only 15 and 14, but they had been caught thieving, and they were going to be sentenced to 10 days in jail and 10 strokes of the strap. And I go, oh, that, I mean, I knew that corporal punishment was around for a long time, much longer than we think. But somehow the image of these two boys, which they would be, having the strap it probably hurt like hell. So anyway, so I'm using that in my book. So sometimes a little thing like that will jump out. I'll embellish it or use it. And so I used, I definitely use newspapers a lot. 
And then if I have to embellish something, I'll go to books. One of the things that I have found, which I love pushing this, one of the best sources, resources for anybody writing history is an instruction book. Because you go into this instruction book and it'll tell you what people knew at the time, what they believed was important and what they didn't know. So I found an absolutely fabulous book when we were in England and it's called Advice to Coroners. So this, oh. it's, it's an old book. It's turn of the century where they didn't even know at the time they could distinguish between mammalian blood and like chicken blood but that's all they could tell it was blood from a cow a dog or a man they couldn't tell so that was interesting so i read those and i have a street directory too from different periods and they're really fun to read <laughs> oh i love it sounds so strange you know? that's what i find that authors who really get into the research it comes across the page I forget who said they got so much into the research. They were like, well, wait a minute. I'm supposed to be writing a book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just need a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. I better sit down now and put that aside. That part is, it's not hard work. I mean, writing's hard work. It really is. I love it, but it's hard work. But the research part's not hard work. It's magic. It's going on little trips into these incredible places. Are you continuing the Murdoch series? I know you jumped up 25 years. One never says never. At the moment, Murdoch has retired to Nova Scotia. He's not raising bees. I forget what he's doing. <laughs> But he's gone to Nova Scotia and I have been able to bring his son, who in my time chronology is now in his early 40s, into this new series. But I didn't want him to be prominent. I wanted the woman, Charlotte, to be prominent. But again, it's a device other writers have used where she consults with him. So he is the official detective. And he can do things that she cannot do because she's a private investigator. I think Sue Grafton did that a lot and it works very well. Murdoch's son, Jack, is in the story and he's interacting with Charlotte and every so often he gets to say, well, as my father told me, <laughs> which is... <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I like that. I must say, it's fun. <laughs> how does Charlotte, how is she introduced to Tom Tyler? Not at all. That's definitely separate. But again, one can create a universe where their paths might cross, but he'd have to be much younger, I guess. World War II and she's yeah. 1936. I'm going to leave them seven years. <laughs> yeah, she might have to take a trip to England. I'm not sure yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> When the Murdoch series introduces real historical characters, like they had Mark Twain, Teddy Roosevelt, when they ha introduce that, is that your writing or is that the television program's writing? I'm not sure who came up with that idea. It wasn't me. And I thought that was fun. I was very happy to walk these people into the show because, again, you can get to say something about history, which is my big love. One of the things I'm very fortunate about is that the writers really try to get their facts right. We fudge it very slightly and I am like the backup and I'm happy to be that. So I will fact check. I guess that's the word. I will fact check. For example, we know that Teddy Roosevelt didn't make a trip to Northern Canada at some point. I like that. We don't know that so-and-so did, but they could have. So keeping it as believable as possible. We've had a lot of feedback. I've had a lot of feedback from viewers that people like that. And I like that too, really. Like, I like it too. Yes, Good. I enjoy those. Yeah, like Tesla and Emma yes. Edison. Edison. Edison, yeah. Well, it sounds to me like you are directly involved in a lot of aspects of the show. I know you probably don't have final say over everything, but it sounds like they turn to you for guidance, shall we say. 
at Malice, we met Charlene Harris, who also had a program on TV. And she said that once she signed on that dotted line that they didn't really want her input on the show. So it's good to hear that they still think of you as a source to go to. I'm afraid Charlene's experience seems to be more typical. I've heard that many times. And again, I'm lucky. It's a very small pond here, to put it that way, in Toronto. And I have a very good relationship with the head of the studio which has to be modified a bit to suit things that have been going on. I don't think what I experience is typical, actually. And as I say, I feel very lucky about that because nothing is worse. Well, there are many worse things, but what is awful for a writer? It's a bit like being a mom, I guess. Charlene's talking about it's kind of like a divorce. Like, so you don't have any interaction with your own creation. And I would find that very hard. I really would. I don't. We do interact. And the thing I learned early on with actors are very, I don't know how to describe it exactly. They take on their characters and a lot of actors do what they call backstory. So they'll create all these things. Very early on when I guess I must have been on the set, a couple of the actors were saying things like, well, Murdoch wouldn't do that. And I'm going, well, wait, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> Why don't you ask me? <laughs> but that was kind of funny, actually. And I often say, to use the analogy again, like I felt sorry to feel a bit like the mother-in-law. He'd got married and she thinks she knows him better than I do. Like Maureen, what are you working on now? I'm working on book four of the Charlotte Frayne series set in 1930. I've moved ever so slightly again fictionally very few people can keep up with real time you just lose everything 15 years what a change would have happened so you can only move forward a little bit in this case it's 1937 we moved on a little bit but it's an incredibly turbulent difficult time in the world and i am shocked honestly at how dreadfully similar it is it's like we, we're going through this again yes all the uncertainty but on the other hand it's good to write about it to be able to try to put that in perspective and in this book it one of the things that i try to follow as well is what's coming up i feel like i'm following the trail rather than making it sometimes and i'm getting very much into the treatment and attitude towards poverty which i've always been interested in so I'm doing a lot of research about what was then called the house of industry, which was the poor house. Because even though at that time there was some social relief, there wasn't a lot. And the whole country and the world was coming out of a depression. So there are a lot of people who are very, very hard up. And I'm trying to explore that in this book as well. I like social issues, you probably noticed. You have a title for it. Well, I've got, it's the weather thing. The first one's heat wave, November rain, cold snap. And so this one is called March Roars. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Forward to that one. Thank you. Maureen, can you please give our audience your website so they can learn if they live in a cave and don't know anything about the Murdoch series or, or about you, could you give them your website? Very simple, www.maureenjennings.com. Well, Maureen, it has been such a pleasure. I'm still a little starstruck that I got to meet you in person. And I hope you attend Malice again so we can spend some more time with you. We wish you all the best with all of your series. And if we come to Canada, we'll look you up. Oh, please do. And I'll absolutely, as long, the only problem in the last two years was COVID. No one yes. could go on with that. But that's now lifted to, I would love it if you come and see me. We'll plan that. Okay, that would be super duper. Well, Maureen, you enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you, you, all of you, very much, then. Bye. Trivia. Last week's question was, Rex Stout was accused by the House Un-American Activities Committee of being a communist. 
A full third of his FBI file is dedicated to what? A. His meetings with known communist sympathizers. B. His novel, The Doorbell Rang. C. His work for the Freedom Project. Or D. His writings in socialist periodicals. The answer is B. His novel, The Doorbell Rang. Stout was one of many American authors closely watched by J. Edgar Hoover's FBI. Hoover considered him an enemy of the Bureau and either a communist or a tool of communist-dominated groups. Stout's leadership of the Authors League of America during the McCarthy era was particularly irksome to the FBI. About a third of his FBI file is devoted to his 1965 novel, The Doorbell Rang. This week's question. Author Graham Greene appeared in what movie? A. Day for Night B. Titanic C. Giant or D. Splendor in the Grass Good luck! And remember, life would be boring without a little mystery. Bye. Bye.